What's going on, everybody? It's Tuesday night, and you are tuned into the Stoned On Sports Podcast, where tonight we've got some ADP battles going on. Everybody knows what it's like. You're sitting there, you've got your pick, you're staring at a couple guys, and you don't know who to choose. We, we are going to help you out with that tonight. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a whole hell of a lot of fun. We've got Kyle here with me as usual. Kyle, how's it going, brother? It's going great, man. Going great. Ready awesome. to Ready to talk some guys here, some some ball players. We're getting ever so close to to opening day. Can't wait. Yeah, me either. Uh, we do have our podcast listener league live up on Yahoo. So if you're interested, pop in there and join. We've got the uh, the information up there on the screen for you as far as roster composition. The draft is coming up here a week from Sunday at two thirty in the afternoon. Uh, I can't wait for that. It, it, it's going to be. A whole heck of a lot of fun and we've got the link there in the comments yep five, but enough of, five, five teams left man we got seven in there need five more to make it a, a a good season so please join if you got any questions just hit us up on the socials or our email all right listed, uh, in the description awesome well, we flapped our gums enough Let, let's yeah. get into this um we are going to start off in round one where everybody starts. We are talking about Mookie Betts with an ADP of four and Corbin Carroll with an ADP of five. Everybody at this point knows Mookie Betts. He's a known commodity. He gives you power. He gives you run production. He'll give you a few steals, hits for a nice average, gets on base. He slugs. Um, the power has really come on in the past couple of years for him. He hits the ball like it owes him money. He well <laughs> above league average in terms of hard hit percentage and exit velocity. And the biggest thing I think for him is he's going to be sitting atop the best lineup in baseball. He's got that multi-position eligibility, second base and outfield, and maybe even shortstop, depending on your league. Dodger Stadium, it, it's an overall neutral park, but it had the fourth most home runs last year. In this spring, he's looking damn good. 10 for 30 with a home run, five walks, and just six strikeouts. Uh, Corbin Carroll, what can you say? Um, speed, right? That's 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 what I think of when I think of him. That's his main asset, uh, 99th percentile uh, in, the, in the league. He bats at the top of the lineup. I see at least 20 homers this year. I think he can swipe 40 or 50 bags in his sleep, honestly. He's young. Obviously, 23 years old, be a second full season. Um, I think there's every reason to believe he can improve. Um, even a repeat of last year's numbers, I think, would be a type, top five pick uh, in this draft as well. But I, you just can't. Uh, the offense there in Arizona can't match the one in L.A. Um, yeah. at all. Um this spring, Corbin Carroll's uh, had a few games, four for 24, a couple doubles, scored a few runs, hadn't stole a base yet in eight games. So, um, you know, maybe just don't worry about that too much in spring training, I guess. But um, either great, either one is is a fine pick, but I think you got to go with bets. Yeah, I'm going to agree there, too. And for me, it comes down to the multi-position eligibility, quite Absolutely. frankly. Absolutely. All right. Next up. Second round, we got Jose Ramirez coming off the board at 17, and right after him, Bryce Harper uh, at 18. And, and look, there, Jose Ramirez is as consistent as they come. Um, five straight full seasons going at least 2020. And he's got several years of, of 30 plus sprinkled in. Last year, 24 dongs, 28 stolen bases. There are con some concerns just about the overall team makeup. Um, he did finish with uh, 80 RBIs and scored 87 runs last year. That would have made three straight 100 RBI seasons, again, if it wasn't for the team. Um, he gets on base at, at over a 35% clip, and, and he does that consistently. Last year, he had as many walks as strikeouts, and he's decreased his strikeouts each of the last three seasons. And it's awesome that he's doing that while also hitting the ball harder. He, he's seeing nice gains in his exit velocity and hard hit percentage. And he's also hitting more fly balls than he has in the past. And it's getting up close to where he was in 2018 when he hit 39 out of the park. Um, 
he's on the struggle bus a bit this spring, just four for 21, although he do ha- does have two home runs. But quite frankly, I'm, I'm not worried about him at all. No. Um, exciting things could happen in Cleveland. I don't know. We'll see this year. Hey, no, it's Ohio. Piss hey, all Central's up for grabs. We'll see. Uh, go Tigers. Um, all right. Next up, Bryce Harper. Um, guy smacks the hell out of the ball, right? Uh, you know, top, very top in uh, exit velocity, hard hit percentage. Um, does have less favorable metrics in like chase rate and whiff rate, but he totally fucking makes up for it with the walks at an elite rate. You, you really can't um, argue with that, with that 401 base percentage last year. Um, that solidifies that role there as the engine, I think, there in the lineup. Um, and sign me up for anybody that gets on base 40% of the time, right? I mean, this is what you need, extra points, extra counting stats uh, for somebody that gets on base that much. I think he's one of the uh, league's most reliable hitters. You said consistent for Ramirez. I'll use reliable for Harper. Um, I think you can anticipate a 30, 90, 90 season uh, with double-digit steals. He had 11 last year, so if he could do that, uh, repeat that again, I'd be pretty happy. I think you draft him and you get a full season of Bryce Harper. That is not a fucking bad thing. This spring, he's played in a few games, six of them, went three for 13, couple doubles, scored three runs, no power yet, uh, and no um, RBIs, but did steal a couple bases. Who do you like in this one? Oh, I'm taking Bryce Harper. All day long. All day long. (laughs) I think he is going to bounce back big time this year. If if you look what he did last year, just after coming back from the injury, he got off to a a slower start, especially in terms of his power. But he really turned it on at at the end of the season, and I think he's going to carry that through into this year. I, I would not be surprised at all if he tops 40 home runs this year. Yeah. Heck yeah. Next up. This will be our round three. Marcus Simeon versus Corey Seager. A battle of the teammates. <laughs> uh, Simeon, great players on my fantasy team last year. Uh, was the number two second baseman overall last season in fantasy. I mean, he's just top 10 in everything. Homer's top six. RBI's fourth. Uh, 40 doubles tied for first. 14 stolen bases, scored 122 runs, which was second at the position. Just crazy. Only four players uh, scored more runs than Simeon last year, and only seven other players reached triple digits in runs and RBIs, and that he was one of them. Um, runs, man, he is so good at this. The fourth consecutive full season in which he scored 100 or more runs. That is points. Might be tough to expect 120 runs again, But that Rangers offense is very, very good. And I will say this, very durable. Guy is playing. He's only missed one game in the last three seasons. And he hasn't been injured or on the IL, I should say, since 2017. So that track record, consistent production, even when he's, uh, you know, 33 years of old, doesn't look like he's slowing down anytime. This spring, he's played in uh, several games, 11 games, went five for 24. Um few singles, the double, couple homers, couple RBIs, and scored five runs. (laughs) So only hitting 208, but starting strong with a 387 OPS. Yeah, and and I'll take a look at Corey Seager. Last year, he was just a, a damn man on a mission. Went over 30 home runs, finished just shy of 100 RBIs, just shy of 90 runs in only 119 games. The dude had 156 hits, had an OPS over 1,000. Yeah, That 33 home runs tied a career high from 2022 and 32 fewer games. The man had 75 extra base hits. Um, the issue is he's played in 140-plus games only three times. You know, um, he's not going to do it this year. He is, I mean, 92nd percentile or better in barrels, barrel rate, exit velocity, max EV in hard hit percentage. I do think he can produce similar numbers, but he was just on a, a, an absolutely torrid pace last year, which I don't really expect him to repeat. And, and quite frankly, in this matchup, I understand that Simeon is the older player, but give me the dude who's out there every single day. Yeah. Um. So you're going with Seager? 
I'm going. Simeon? No, I'm going with Simeon. Simeon. Okay. Uh, and Seager's a little like four years younger than uh, Simeon, but I agree too. The the durability um, that definitely um, puts the scales in Simeon's favor. It does. Now, if you ask me the same question next year, I might take Seager just because of the age, because age. eventually we're going to start to see the age related decline with Simeon. Agreed. Next up, round four. Adelise Garcia, the Rangers versus our very own Tarek Skubal with the Detroit Tigers. Um, <laughs> this is a tough one. This is a tough one. I think I know what you're going to say, but um, Adelise, career best season last year. Um, just cra crashed the home runs there with 39 of them. Really had a lot to do with his surge and his fly ball rate. I hope he can keep that up. He was almost 47%. Uh, last season versus um, just under 40% uh, the season before. Um, he's had three seasons in a row of 27 home runs or more. I think that's awesome uh, consistency. Improved a lot of his plate discipline stats last year. Um, <clears throat> top 10% in many hitting metrics. Expected slugging, average exit velo, uh, barrel rate, hard hit rate. Texas Rangers, that lineup projected to hit third. That lineup's just as potent as, you know, the Dodgers or the Braves. I think he delivers real value at his current ADP. Played four games this spring, two for 12, a double, a home run, and three RBIs. So I really like him. I had him last year. I really like Tarek Skubal, too. You know what? You and me both, brother. And look, the hype train for him has already left the station, right? <laughs> I mean, last year coming back from injury, he was a certified badass. Absolutely. Um, struck out over a hundred batters, but it, it, you know, which was down from 2022, but he did it in 37 and two thirds, fewer innings. His K per nine jumped up to 11.4. His strikeout rate was 32.9%, 10%. Above, above league average and in the top 4% overall and say, all right, cool. Well, does he, does he allow base runners? Nope, absolutely not. <laughs> Walk rate four and a half percent. Also top 4%. A dude only walked 14 dudes. Now, granted he didn't pitch the full season, but still for the amount of innings he did throw to only walk 14 guys and only walk 1.6 per nine. That shit's crazy, dude. Um, he got a, a nice four and a half point increase in his ground ball rate up to an elite 50.8%. Lowered his home run rate and fly ball rate. There's just, you love the swing and miss in his profile too. 31.3% whiff rate, 33.5% chase rate. And not to nerd out, and, and I'm by far, you know, far from a math guy. 11 and a half mile an hour delta between his fastball and changeup, <laughs> which is just wicked. His changeup is an out pitch over a 50% whiff rate. Yeah. Half of the swings against that pitch got nothing but air. This year in spring, in five innings pitch, he's only struck out half of the 16 batters that he's faced while allowing one walk and one hit. Yeah. Put put his ass on my squad. Yeah. Period. Uh uh, I'll agree with you there as well. I, I it's cl it's it's closer than I thought it would be. Um, I'm you as well. You know, you can find cheaper pitching later on, and I feel like to try and get if you can get Garcia now, you take him. But Tarek Skubal's really special, and I think this is going to be um, the beginning of his peak years. Shit, I hope so. We got loud boy in the house. What's going on, brother? Appreciate you coming through. Hope you're enjoying the show. A little bit of a change from what we've been doing for the past several weeks. We're done with the position previews, and, and now we're here to help folks out with their draft. Speaking of which, we are round on five. to round five. Round five. Uh, Nico Horner versus Jazz Chisholm Jr. Nico Horner. But I don't have him, so I'm going to talk right. about Jazz Chisholm Jr. <laughs> um, he's the epitome, I think, of the high risk, high reward uh, kind of guy. Limited to only 97 games last year. Turf toe, you know how that can kind of uh, linger. Um, it takes a while, especially uh, with baseball and and football, uh, for that matter. Um, he's only appeared in 157 games the last two years. I don't like that. Um, 
He struggles. His advanced med- uh, metrics here indicate struggles, notably a very high strikeout rate at 30% um, as well. Biggie, too, he lost uh, the second base eligibility. He played, I don't know, 50 or 60 games in 2022. Didn't play any of them last year at, at second. He was all in the outfield. Probably had a lot to do with him being hurt, too. Um, so he is no longer eligible. Uh, that kind of affects his, his versatility in the in the fantasy lineups. I don't think he's enough of a difference maker for this price tag. Um, he was drafted in the mid forties or, or higher last year looks to be in the sixties, seventies this year is the drop, uh, in the price tag worth the risk. I'm not so sure. Um, it is worth mentioning though. He's an excellent defensive outfielder. So if he gets some time and and it's up between him and somebody that can't play defense very well, I think he's going to get a lot of time. If he's healthy as the potential for uh, a 2020 season, along with, 70 RBIs or so. Um, this spring, he's played in a, f- a few games, five for 17, couple doubles, couple runs, RBI and a stolen base. But it's a no for me, dog. Well, let, let's see what you got to say about Nico. Um, the dude, he, I don't want to say he came out of nowhere last year, but, but I think he's somebody who, um, really benefited from the new rules. He had 43 stolen bases last year. Not really any power to speak of. Uh, he only had nine home runs. I mean, there really wasn't even a, a whole lot of extra base power there. I mean, he got some doubles, but you know, his game is is Willie Mays Hayes. Um, he only ended up with a 729 OPS, but where he excels, he is incredibly patient at the plate. 96 percentile strikeout rate. He struck out only 12.1% of the time, which was actually an increase year over year. He was at 11%. Um, He's got a 99th percentile whiff rate, 12.4%. The dude excels at making contact. He's got some dual eligibility too. You can plug him in at second base or shortstop. And look, at the end of the day, he was still only one of four players uh, at his position with over 500 points. It's a decent lineup there in Chicago, and and we've talked about this, it, you know, at length. Wrigley Field plays very different in the early season; than it does later in the season. I would like to see him draw some more walks. He had a career high forty nine last season, but still only managed a seven point one percent walk rate. And he's off to kind of a slow start this year; just four for twenty two. Quite frankly, I've never really been a big uh, Jazz Chisholm guy, and I continue to not be a, a big. Uh, Jazz Chisholm guy, and it's just stupidly tempting to call him Chaz Chisholm, and and <laughs> like making a, a mental effort to not do that. That's why I'm saying his name so slowly. But yeah, g- give me Nico. Uh, he's, uh, I'll take him there. Yeah, uh, I'll agree with you. Uh, you remember the uh, the John Wayne movie? I think it was called just Chisholm. Um, yeah, Western, an old Western. Who we got in the chat? Derek, welcome to the show, man. Jazz is a free agent in my 10 team. That makes sense if it's a 10 team. <laughs> He's just, there's better outfielders out there, uh, in my opinion, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. And, and just the injuries are a concern. It is. Not so silent majority. What's up? Welcome back, brother. Hey guys, just getting in the door. How's it going? We're doing good. We're doing a little ADP battle today. We've got, I don't know, 17, 18 rounds of some guys. We're, we're just going back, you know, putting two, uh, one against another and see who we like better. Yeah. Interesting little exercise as we progress there, uh, here through draft season. We've got opening day coming up just here in uh, a little bit over two weeks, actually two weeks from Thursday, and, and we'll be live and on the air for opening day well that evening but yeah. still it, it, it's going to be cool <laughs> and, and i look forward to talking about a Tarek scoobal and detroit tigers win heck yeah uh and not so silent call me anthony no problem anthony you got it man heck yeah all right next up we got round six uh matt mclean versus christian yelich oh <sighs> jesus um Matt McLean. I think he adds value to your lineup with the, with the stolen bases, even though he, he had, what, 14 last year, even though he barely played in half of Cincinnati's games. I think both his power and the speed are legit. I think the power is legit even in Cincinnati's ballpark. Um, 
Last year, he did kind of have a professional low fly ball rate of 37.1%. Um, but I think he'll create more power upside this season um, because uh, when he was in the minor league levels, he was at 48% in AAA, 44% in AA. I know he has the skills uh, to get that fly ball rate increased. Um, also, super fast guy, blazing speed, top 10% of the league in uh, sprint speed. Um, had a 74% success rate in stolen bases. So he's got the green light, you know, all the time. If he can play 140 games this season, 30 steals. I think he could do it. Now, primary struggles is plate discipline. Strikes out, <laughs> strikes out quite a bit, 28.5% of the time, uh, and only walks 7.7% 7 .7 of the time. Much better. He had much better rates in, in both of those categories while he was in the minors. So improvement should be expected he's only played one game this spring couple of bats no hits with one strikeout nothing special um with Marte out there now it's a little more clear there with all the infielders I think um I like Mac McLean this year yeah I do too and, and he's somebody who he was going much higher than this uh if you look back about a month but he had a he had an injury here this spring I can't remember exactly what it is and, and he really slaw yeah, he saw his ADP slide a little bit. Well, let's come over to the other side of this equation. We're going to talk about Christian Yelich. Played in 100, 144 games last year, topped 100 runs, 34 doubles, 19 home runs, drove in 76, and he stole 28, which is not awful. At a, a you know, we'll call it a, a pretty damn decent slash line, a 278, 374, 47. Uh, anytime you get an on-base percentage north of 350, 360, you know you're doing something right. Uh, he His walk rate dipped a little bit, but so, you know, so did his strikeout rate. So I'll take that trade off. He's hitting the ball harder, both in terms of his hard hit rate and his EV, and, and they're significantly above average. He's somebody who was a big beneficiary of eliminating the shift. He's dealt with some health issues the past few years. And, and you know, you can go on baseball reference and say, Matt, well, you know, he played 140 games, 150 games. Yeah. I get that. Even if he didn't always go on the IL or miss a lot of games, playing hurt takes a toll, especially on the counting stats. You get up there to the ballpark and, and you're just not feeling it. And credit to him for being a trooper and, and playing through all that. The lineup, I'm I'm not convinced, is going to be great. So, you know, he may have a, a slightly diminished opportunity for run production. I mentioned earlier he hits the ball hard, but his ground ball rate is continuing to increase, and, and that's going to limit his home run potential. He's actually reverting back into the type of hitter he was earlier in, in, in his career uh, when he was with the Marlins. Now, don't get me wrong, he was still a damn good player, but... <sighs> I don't know. I've never really been a big Yelich guy. He's done decent so far this spring. And and one thing I want to throw this out there, like as we talk about how players are doing this spring, that shit is not the gospel, right? Yeah, players absolutely. are there working on stuff. They're they're getting back into, into game shape, especially with pitchers. Uh, I was listening to uh, an interview the other day with um, – Oh, what's that dickhead's name? Doesn't matter. Anyways, um, you know, he was talking about for the first couple outings for uh, for his pitchers. It was Steve Phillips, former GM of the Mets. His pitchers would throw nothing but fastballs and changeups for their first couple outings just to kind of get back into the feel of things. And then people like us will come along and take a look at their spring training stats and, and see they gave up some runs. And all of a sudden we're chicken little and the sky is falling. All right. So, you know, this is to give you a little bit of context as to what's going on. But again, you know, don't read too deep into it. And I've gone way off on a tangent. Point being, if you would have asked me this question a week ago between Matt McClain and Christian Yelich, I would have taken Christian Yelich. But now that Noel V. Marte is going to be gone for half the season because he's popping them peds and we've got some more clarity as to what the infield situation is going to look like in Cincinnati, McClain. combined with just the absolute band box that they play in. Yeah. Give me Matt McClain and, and give me the upside. Yep. I agree, man. I uh Next up, round eight. Uh, Alex Bregman at an ADP of 86 versus Christian Walker at 90. Bregman. Is he he? I feel like he just get over overlooked because he's the boring guy. Yep, I could see that. He's the boring guy. He's the boring guy that was the second best third baseman last season. Um, he's the boring guy that had more walks than strikeouts. 
he's the boring guy that gets on base and scores runs and knocks in runs. It's crazy. He's the guy that has one of the safest floors at that position. He improved on all of his stats from 22 to 23. Like I said, walks very frequently, doesn't strike out. He was in the top 4% of the league in, in strikeouts. I think a 260, 20 home run, 90 RBI, and 90 run, you can take that to the bank. I think that's a great value at this pick at, eight, at um, 86. I'll draft him over Christian Walker. I, there's an, even a, a scenario where I would draft Bregman in the fifth round. Could happen. Um, this spring, he's, he's, he, I know. He's had seven games. He's played four for 18, three singles, a double, and scored a few runs. Um, I had him on my team last year. Um, I would take him on my team this year. I'm not anti Alex Bregman. Um, and, and Christian Walker, I think, is one of the more underrated batters in the league. Uh, he's got back to back 30 home run seasons. He drove in 100 last year. And you combine the 30 home runs, he hit another 36 doubles, yeah. which is fantastic. He even chipped in 11 stolen bases. I, I mean, that shit's crazy. Um, you look over the past few years, his strikeout rate is decreasing, his fly ball rate is increasing. Um, and when you look at somebody who's, you know, typically going for more power, you'll usually see their strikeout rate increase. So that's a, a nice little trend there. He's got an above average walk rate and, and hard hit rate. I like the lineup and team context. I think he's going to continue to have plenty of run producing opportunity there in Arizona this year. He's not flashy and, and he's almost like the first base version of Alex Bregman. He's really very boring. Um, but still, I like that he's got a little bit more power upside. I don't necessarily know that there's 40 home runs in his bat, but I think a, another 30 home run, 100 RBI season is completely uh, it, expectable. That's not even a word. Um, <laughs> we'll call it we'll call it probable. Um, yeah, I think he's going to go 30 and 100 again this year. He, he's going to continue to give you that extra base power. Um, on base percentage is not great. It, I mean, he gets on base roughly a third of the time. Um, but still that that's really my only complaint with him. I think this one really comes down to how I built my team up until this point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what areas I'm looking to fill in. It is, but you got to choose one. Got to choose one. You know what? The Astros are cheaters. Give me Christian Walker. Uh, I want to actually win my league, and I think the lineup's way better in Houston. I'll go with Bregman. All right. We got, not so, we got not so silent majority. How would you guys compare Josh Naylor and Alec Bohm? I like them both, and I'm really high on Naylor. Bohm has the first base, third base eligibility. How do they compare to you, and is the third base eligibility bring uh, any change? Does it change anything? You know, it's interesting that we were talking about um, – boring players because that's what Alec Bohm is. Oh, yeah. You know, it, kudos to him. He doesn't really strike out a whole hell of a lot. He doesn't really walk a whole hell of a lot. He's not going to give you a lot of power. Um, Josh Naylor is, he's a bowling ball of a dude, yeah, right? He you know, he's, he's going to give you a, a little bit more pop provided he stays healthy. I've never really been an, an Alec Bohm guy. I'm not going to get too wrapped up in, in the, the multi-position eligibility. It does make him a little bit more intriguing. I think if anything, I would probably go with Alec Bohm just because he's in so much of a better offense. He's going to yeah. have a lot more opportunity at run production. Whereas Josh Naylor, you know, <clears throat> he's got Jose Ramirez and, and not a whole hell of a, a lot else there for him. Um, I mean, I'd listen to an argument for either one, but I'm going to go with Bohm, but it's not by a whole hell of a lot. Yeah, I think Naylor's somebody that's putting together all the pieces to become an elite contact hitter. Um, but yeah, not in Cleveland right now. I don't like it. I, I, I agree with you on Bohm. Yeah. Great, qu great question, Anthony. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, next up. All right. So we're going to the ninth round. We're going to talk about Jordan Walker 
coming in at an ADP of 101 in last year's hot rookie that everybody wanted. And now you've got him going up against Wyatt Langford at ADP of 107 and the hot rookie that everybody wants this year. You know, you, you look at Jordan Walker last year, and it was a damn good rookie season. 16 home runs, drove in 51, scored 51, stole a couple bags. Triple slash was, was more than acceptable. Um, he finished with a 114 OPS plus, so he was 14% better than the average major leaguer, and, and that's pretty damn good for a rookie. Um, he's got an above average hard contact. Both his exit velocity and hard hit rate are higher. The ground, ground ball rate's a, a little bit high, but it's not a, a unexpected. Yeah, remember, this dude's just 22 years old, and you look at his scouting profile, he's got 80-grade game power and raw power. And you say to me, Matt, what the hell is the difference there? Raw power is how, how, how far can you hit the ball? It's just a, a measure or a projection of distance. Game power is how many home runs you're going to hit. Right. So they're saying basically he is an elite power prospect. I think 25 plus home runs for him this season is not unreasonable at all. The run production is still likely going to be kind of up in the air. He's, he's going to be hitting lower in the lineup, at least to start the season. And he's not the greatest overall hitter, right? But I think he can settle in somewhere around league average. He's off to a decent start this spring through through 10 games. Um, he's got the elite prospect pedigree, just like this other guy we're going to talk about. Kyle, why don't you take us to school on Wyatt Langford? Wyatt Langford. Ugh. Um, fourth pick of the, the draft last year. Uh, rank, consistently ranks in the top three of prospects in all of baseball. baseball. Blasted through minor leagues last season. All of it, just all four levels gone. Played a total of 100 or 100, <laughs> total of 44 games um, with 10 homers, 30 RBI, or sorry, yeah, 30 RBIs, 36 runs, 12 stolen bases, and an OPS of 1.157. That's pretty fucking good. Yes, it is. <laughs> kind of waiting to see how this uh, spring turns out to see if he, you know, I, I would definitely, uh, he's somebody I, I'm uncomfortable picking this early. I would wait a little bit more, but um, my peepers see a 20 steel guy here um, as well. I, I like his speed. He's only, he's going for 11 bucks uh, average auction value right now in NFBC. That seems a little bit high for him, um, but we'll see. Um, this spring, he's got a one, two, four, like the one, two, four, five OPS. He's had four home runs, nine ribbies. But he has struck out 10 times for an over 31% uh, strikeout rate. Again, springs training. Everybody's fine-tuning, figuring it out. But um, he's young, and I'm excited about him. Yeah, and I'm not going to go head over heels about the home runs that he hit off dudes wearing number 82 that are you know going to be working down at the car wash here again in, in a few weeks. Working um, at the car wash. There you go. Spare us from that, please. Yeah. Please. Um, <laughs> you know, I think honestly, if it, his ADP now, if you give it another week, I think he's going to be inside the top 100 before all is said and done. And I'm just not willing to pay that price for him. Nope. Um, I think there is uh, room for growth there with Jordan Walker. I think Wyatt Langford will will end up hitting for a better average. And, and when both careers are all said and done, Wyatt Langford very well may be the better overall player. But for this <laughs> year, give me the six-pick discount and give me Jordan Walker. I will concur, sir. I, I, I would also go with Walker in this round. There was some jabroni in our home league that said Wyatt Langford is going to be the best right-handed hitter of our generation, and, and I saw that, and I had a nice little chuckle about that. I remember that. All right. Round 10. Spencer Torkelson, ADP of 111, versus George Springer, ADP of 118. Springer, number 24 outfielder last season. He's the number 27th off the board. This season going for about 15 bucks on average. Uh, played in pretty fully healthy season last uh, year. Only missed, I think, eight games. Um, but he endured by far the worst season of his career across the board. Um, his his quality of contact metrics have, have really um, started to dip in recent years. More specifically, uh, you know, every year over year in, in recent campaigns, 
they just keep going down. He did have his first 2020 season last year, which was impressive for how long he's been in the league. He's 34, um, but below the league average in, in key areas like hard hit rate, barrel rate, exit velo. Um, I think he remains a risky bet coming off a career worst season at the plate. If he's healthy, he'll you know remain hitting leadoff for that team. I think he's ideally suited as an outfield three, four, probably. I'd choose Torkelson here. You know what? I'm going to agree with that. And you look at the the growth <laughs> that he showed between his rookie season and last season. Remember, his ass got sent down. It did. He did. Yeah. He got sent back down to AAA, and he responded. 31 home runs, almost drove in 100 for a not-so-great Tigers team, chipped in 34 doubles, scored 88 times. The average leaves a bit to be desired. 233, that's, that's we'll call it a, a hair below league average. It's about 10 points below, something like that. On base percentage, similar. Had a nice uh, nice slugging there, well above average. Come in in, in an OPS of over 750, which you absolutely love. This dude smokes the ball. I mean, he smokes the ball. Exit velocity and hard hit percentage are well above average. His hard hit percentage is 50.9%. So over half of his hits are over uh, 95 miles an hour. Uh, he's good for walks and home runs. Strikeouts are high. Strikes out about a quarter of the time. Not as bad as some of the other dudes that we've seen up over 30%, but still there's some opportunity there. Um, and he did an excellent job last year cutting down on the ground balls. He's just under 34% almost 9% below league average. The Tigers are, are not going to be a, a really good team this year. They're not going to be trash, um, but that is going to place, uh, we'll call it a glass ceiling uh, on his run production ability. I, I think he can, you know, he can probably duplicate what he did last year, maybe a little bit improvement, but not a whole hell of a lot more. He's another dude with, with 70 grade power, but he's got the 60 grade hit tool. I expect to see some gains with his batting average this year. I mean, the the dude can hit. Absolutely. He's been off to a slowish start this spring, but I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. Give me the the much younger Torque uh over an aging George Springer. All day long. Yeah, Torkelson. If he he can continue to improve that that patience while reducing them strikeouts like you said, he will definitely be around 10 steal. Absolutely. And now we're going to take a, a quick break from this ADP battle and, and something Kyle and I have been talking about. We absolutely love interacting with you guys all the time through the chat and everything, but we want to take it to the next level. So if any of you are interested, shoot us an email. You can find our email address there in, in the description of this video and every other video. We'd love to have you on. Come on, shoot to shit for five or 10 minutes. Just give us a heads up on, on what you'd like to talk about. You ain't even got to turn your camera on. Just treat right. it just like a, a call-in radio show, and we'll chew the fat with you and give you an opportunity to talk about what you want to talk about. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to build community here, and we think the best way to do that is more interaction with the people who join us each and every week, and we think this is going to be a great way to do so. Uh, so again, you know, if anyone out there is interested, drop us a line. We'll we'll bring you on and and. Uh, make this an even more interactive show. Yeah. Uh, the email is stoned on sports one at gmail.com. I'll, I'll drop it in the uh, chat for you guys. If anybody's interested, but hit us up and then we'll uh, plan it out. Uh, so we know, you know, what day you're coming on. If anyone's interested. Yeah. Not so silent that interaction or Anthony, sorry, man, <laughs> that interaction <laughs> sounds great. Looking forward to it. Yeah. If you're interested, Hit us up, send us an email, have it come on. Let us know what you want to talk about. Like Matt said, I think it'd be something interesting to do. I'd like to get, uh, you know, some more opinions from you guys, and a little more interaction. And we're like Matt said, you know, we're building this, you know, fantasy sports community here for baseball and football. And um, I think it'll help. All right. Now back to your regularly scheduled programming. We're headed to the 12th round. We're talking about Sean Murphy with an ADP of 143 and Cedric Mullins of an, with an ADP of 144 going right next to each other. And a lot of times these are the most difficult decisions you're going to face. 
Sean Murphy, he was, and we're going to use a cliche line here, the, the tale of two seasons. He started out in April and May lit the damn world on fire the same way that uh, Mr. Oppenheimer thought he was going to do when he detonated that nuke. And every time he stepped up to stepped up to the plate, that's what he did. He hit bombs, um, hit a career high, 21 home runs, scored 65, knocked, knocked in 68. You got a catcher with an on-base percentage north of 360 with an 11.2% walk rate. With those kind of numbers, you're going to take him striking out 22.5% of the time. 251 average, and look, in today's baseball, that that's an above-average batting average, and that's a lot of saying average in a very short amount of time. <laughs> First half of the year, he had a 999 OPS and hit 17 of his 21 home runs, drove in 55 of his 68 RBIs. He was absolutely elite. And then the second half of the year, the wheels fell off and he struggled to hit 160, struggled so much that his ass come in at a buck 59. Yeah, he had a horrible September with a with a 451 OPS. Yep. Um, he did improve his walk rate and a solid on base percentage make him more valuable in, you know, in your, uh, in points leagues, or if you're in a roto league that where you've swapped out average and instead of for a uh, um, base percentage and he's look, he's part of, you know, I, I think we can all agree the Dodgers are probably going to have the best lineup in, in the national league, but Atlanta is, is right there with them and with probably the second best man in a spot in the middle of the lineup, maybe he hits a little bit lower, but he's still going to have that run producing opportunity. He's off to a pretty hot start this year. Um, I remember Murphy last year hit those 21 homers and he was fifth, I think, among catchers, um, despite having a hundred fewer plate appearances, um, cause he does split with, uh, with Darno uh, frequently. So, all right. Cedric Mullins, number 58 outfielder last season, um, dealt with a lot of injuries last year, specifically groin, um, as well. The question of this season that we ask for a lot of players is, is can he stay healthy? He's already dealing with a hamstring issue this spring. He's, he's just day to day, but you know how hamstring issues uh, can go similar to groins too. They, they take a while to heal as well. I think he's just pretty much just a speedster now who hits soft fly balls, which is not um, a recipe for success. Um, you know, he's projected uh, on a lot of sites around 18 home runs and, and 27 stolen bases. Starling Marte is pretty much projected for about the same 15 and 30, and he can be drafted, you know, 50, 60, 70 picks later. Um, and with Baltimore, that influx of young guys, I don't know if Cedric will be able to stay out there. Um, you got Austin Hayes, Santander. I think Jorge Mateo's uh, looking to play some outfield because of the crowded infield. I stay away from, from Cedric Mullins. I, I go with Murphy, even with Travis Darno stealing some playing time. Yeah. I'm going to go. Uh, I, I'm taking Murphy and, and granted in, within the context of which guy would I rather take? Now, I think there's some options at catcher available later on in the draft, four or five rounds later, that I like just as much. Um, but for purposes of this exercise, yeah, give me uh, give me Sean Murphy. Okay, what do we got in the chat here? Uh, I don't want to butcher your name. Mahai Amuza gave us a thumbs up. Appreciate that. Yeah, and if any of you out there in the in the chat are watching, if you haven't already, please uh Please consider subscribing, like the stream. You know, it doesn't cost you anything, but like we said, we're we're working on building a, a community here and you are the only ones who can help us do it. So we we appreciate every single one of you that comes through, no matter how long you're here for. Anthony says, Mullins was a drag on my home team last year. There's too much talent on the Orioles. I'm letting him go by this year. I think it's a great strategy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. You know, he, I think he's kind of playing to keep his job, quite For frankly. Sure. Uh, oh, next. Up. We got oh. one more here. Right. We're in on the ground floor with you guys. Hopefully, we'll look back fondly on these early days when you have 100,000 subs. 
Love. That would be that would be amazing because <laughs> Kyle and I both just we love doing this and and there's a lot of prep that goes into it but it really is a, a labor of love and and all you folks that are here uh, our right. day one crew you know we we appreciate the hell out of you and and Anthony I thank you very much also the best way for this to grow as well is word of mouth I'm sure you got friends family that that play fantasy football or fantasy baseball. You think we're getting, you think we're getting good. You think we're pretty good. I should say, um, you know, tell your friends, tell your family, let them know, share it. It's so easy to just share links to things with technology and cell phones these days. It takes nothing. It takes a second, but yeah, we appreciate your support, man. Yeah, that's it. Pester your friends until they subscribe or they stop being your friend. That's a sacrifice we're expecting from all of you. <laughs> I love it. All right, we're on to round 13. Uh, Merrill Kelly at an ADP of 147 versus Shane Bieber with an ADP of 149. Shane Bieber, um, number 75 pitcher last season. He's the number 61 off the board. He's going for about nine bucks on average. Dealt with some elbow inflammation last year, was limited to just um, 21 starts, but this is the second time in three years that he's missed uh, a large portion uh, of the season. He's not the same pitcher he was uh, earlier in his career. Um, he's pretty good with the the, the fastball. Velo has, has dropped significantly over three and a half miles an hour in the last four seasons. Um, he does have a pretty good ground ball rate. I think that's what saves him a lot with the uh, above average and run prevention skills. He, he, he also limits home runs pretty well. He could be a solid bet to bounce back uh, as a starter. I'll tell you why. He's a free agent after this year. So he's going to be auditioning. And I think I mentioned it uh, when we talked about our position preview. I think we did dis discuss him. Um, could also see him traded at the deadline. If Cleveland's out of it, as it looks like they're not going to be the strongest team this year, uh, maybe he gets sent to a contender and can help you win a championship towards the end of the year. I, I kind of love him at this ADP. Um, I like Shane Bieber. Merrill Kelly, less so. So this is the classic dilemma, right? You're looking for upside or floor. And, and Merrill Kelly is going to give you an excellent floor. He is a pitcher's pitcher. I do think, <clears throat> excuse me, his ERA last year was kind of a mirage right? Which he's in the desert. They should all be used to that because he outperformed his FIP and his uh, ex-FIP and ex-ERA, but he did give you 177 innings. He made 30 starts. He saw an increase in his strikeout rate to 25.9. We'll call it 26% strikes out nine and a half per nine. The walks are a little high though. 9.6% rate walks about three and a half per nine. And again, we talked about this when we were talking about the pitchers, about a third of every or one third of all base runners come around to score. And so if he's walking three dudes, count on that to be one run. And that's irrespective of, of any hits or anything uh, like that. And when you're talking about a guy with a low ERA like that, across 200 innings, eight earned runs accounts for uh, half a run of ERA. So if you're you're getting more and more from walks, it, it's something to look at. Uh, he does a, a halfway decent job limiting his, his hard contact. He did give up some, um, but you know you're you're looking here. Where in the hell are we at? Round 13, ADP around 150. You know your Corbin Burns, your your Spencer Striders. These guys aren't available here. So these are dudes with warts. There there's some issues there. He does have some nice swing and miss, 27% whiff rate, chase rate just shy of 33%. Um, he's a better play in points leagues than in, in roto leagues just because you, you get the points for innings pitched. Um, he's looked pretty good in his lone spring start, but again, we don't know what he's out there working on. Uh, but for purposes of my narrative and wanting to choose him over Merrill Kelly, we're going to say that that's a good thing and he's dialed in and, and ready to go for the season. Um, He's positioned nicely to get wins because, you know, as we've talked about before, wins, very unpredictable from year to year. So, but just given the team context, he, he's got more win upside than Shane Bieber. This is another one where it's going to come down to how I built my team up to yeah. this point in the draft. If I, if I'm looking for a steady Eddie, 
give me Merrill Kelly. If I want somebody with upside, give me Shane Bieber. I will say the way I typically build my team, I want floor early on. I want a, you know, as close to a guaranteed return as I can get early in the draft. And then later in the draft, that's when I take my chances with upside. So if I'm building my teams the way I normally do, Shane Bieber is going to be the pick. I'm going with Shane Bieber. Go. <laughs> All right, where are we at here? Skipping around, we're at round 15. That's it. Jackson Holiday at an ADP of 177 versus James Outman, an ADP of 180. Man, Jackson Holiday is an exciting player. Um, last year, 12 home runs, 75 RBIs, 113 runs. I think his best stat uh, was 101 walks versus 118 strikeouts. It's pretty good. That shows some maturity for how young he is. Um, I think there's several major leaguers who couldn't walk 101 times over two seasons. So um, he's projected on the 40-man roster at this moment. Even if he doesn't break camp on the roster, you're, you're sure to see him this season. I, I can't see a scenario where he's not. That's a young, exciting team. Draft him. Use a bench spot on him. Draft him. <laughs> He's been pretty hot this spring. Nine of 28. Or sorry, eight for 29. Flip that. Uh, three singles, two doubles, two triples, a home run, five ribbies, three runs, a stolen base, and an OPS of 917. So he's having a fine spring. Um, I will definitely choose him. You know, he's... I mean, he's the number one overall prospect for a reason. Uh, James Outman, he had a, a damn good rookie year. 23 home runs, drove in 70, scored scored 86, stole 16 bags. He had a respectable triple slash, 248, 353, 437. Good for a 790 OPS. Strikeouts are a massive concern. He's in the bottom 6% of the league uh, with just shy of a 32% strikeout rate. Struck out 181 times last year. You got to try to strike out that many times. Why did he strike out so damn much? Because he's got serious contact issues. Bottom 2% of the league with a 36.7% whiff rate. Here's the thing. If you don't make contact 70% of the time, that is a massive problem. Uh, like most young guys, he's overmatched against breaking pitches, managed just 201 with a, a, a 176 expected batting average against and a 43.3% whiff rate. Now there is some good there. You, look, he walked 12% of the time. It's excellent. It's about 4% above average, 3.5%, somewhere around there. Um, he's got good speed. I, I expect the stolen bases to stick. This guy is a dead pull hitter, and you can hit home runs out there at Dodger Stadium. Again, we beat this part into the ground. We absolutely love the line up there with the Dodgers, and, and he's been off to a decent start so far this year. I think his playing time is relatively safe despite all the strikeouts and contact issues, but I think if it continues and, and we get towards the dog days of summer and, and he's still striking out north of 30% of the time, maybe he loses a, a little bit of playing time. If I had to choose one, I'm going to go with Outman just because we don't even know if Jackson Holiday is going to be up with the big club on, on, you know, for opening day. I think he's going to be there sooner rather than later, and, and he may get sent down just for some service time manipulation. Yeah, that's um, true. But even if they're doing that, he's, you know, we'll call it he's up by May 1st, but still losing out on a full month of production, especially if you're in a roto league, like that can be a problem. You know, I, I think the saving grace there is Jackson holiday is an infielder and, and Outman plays the outfield. So, I mean, depending on how your draft falls, I could certainly envision a scenario where somebody ends up with both. That's true. I just, man, if you can get him on your roster and you know, like I said, at least put him on a bench spot and you have a spot. Holiday would be a nice grab. He will, and I'm not expecting much power from him this year. I, I think he can get to double-digit home runs, but I don't sure. think he'll hit 20. Sure. Okay, skipping round 16. Round 17, Tyler O'Neill, ADP of 203 versus uh, Jared Kelnick, 204. 
Tyler O'Neill, number 49th fielder, outfielder off the board, going for about seven bucks, average auction value. Um, traded to Boston this offseason. Uh, Lordy, he had a great 2021. You want to talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's relevant now. <laughs> but uh, but he, it is because he hasn't fucking come close uh, since. He has improved uh, the, the plate discipline metrics each year since that magical 21 campaign. Um, so I like that. Um, I don't know if playing with the Cardinals last year, they really had a shuffle in the outfield. Uh, all last year combined with uh, time on the IL as well for him with, with lower back and left hamstring injuries and uh, back injuries and power, mi- power hitters don't mix. Not usually um, his average exit velocity dropped almost four miles an hour uh, since that 2021 season barrel rate remains above average. I know he had a pretty toxic relationship with the manager there in um, Marmel in uh st louis so hopefully being in this new spot will help him find some some old spark in his bat i don't think playing time will be an issue like it was uh with the cardinals he's expected to play uh receive playing time every day they that boston team really lacks outfield depth uh especially if yoshida is going to be at dh uh, most of the time i don't know why you'd have him in the field anyway because he's actually fucking atrocious at defense <laughs> um I think he benefits from from the park switch as well. Fenway uh, boasts uh, a park factor of 109 for right-handed batters. Um, and um, Bush Stadium uh, inflates hits less with the 101 park factor, uh, suppressing home runs with the 90. I read that shitty. Um, <laughs> the park's better, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and... I think it's a more potent lineup there in Boston as well. Red Sox ranked uh, 11th in, in run scored last year. Cardinals were a lot, a few spots lower at 19 physical guy. I think he's got some, some pretty good physical gifts. I think he's currently probably an afterthought in, in most drafts, but if he can play every day, I think I could pay huge dividends, especially where you're going to select him. Um, already been dealing with a calf injury. Um, this spring, but he did uh, play today already. He's had six games. He's four for 18, a couple singles, a double, a home run, four walks I like, and a couple stolen bases. So um, somebody to look for in the later rounds. So I'm going to throw a phrase out, and I'm sure most of you have heard it, and I think this applies uh, perfectly to Jared Kelnick. He is a post-hype sleeper. He came up with uh, – uh, with the Mariners back in 2021, a lot of fanfare, had the amazing prospect pedigree and just kind of petered out. Um, you know, he had contact issues and, and you know, he displayed some uh, emotional regulation issues as well while he was there. And so his ass gets sent to Atlanta. Um, you know, last year he did all right. We saw some improvement. He managed to hit 253, got on base just shy of 33% of the time, slugged 419. In OPS, just under 750, but considering where he started from, we'll take it. But looking at that batting average, I think that there's a chance that comes down this year. There there was a, a good amount of luck involved. He had a 359 BABIP, which just nobody is going to sustain that year over year. He did show a little bit of extra base power, though. 25 doubles, 11 home runs, drove in 49, stole 13. He increased his walk rate as up to 9.9% and slightly reduced his strikeout rate to 31.7. And just imagine how high that shit has to be if you reduce it and you're still at almost 32%. <laughs> um, his exit velo is, is, you know, pretty damn good. Just a hair under 91 miles an hour. His hard hit rate. Uh, was about 45 and a half percent. He's an upside play based on the pedigree and in the offense. And, and despite all the struggles he's had last year, he still managed a 109 OPS plus somehow. Um, this is another like floor versus ceiling decision. It, this spring, he has looked like ass, just being completely honest. But it, I mean, pick 204, what the hell are you expecting? Right. Yeah. You know, I'll take a bet on the upside. Tyler O'Neill has a safer floor, but at this point in the draft, give me a lottery ticket. I'll go with Kelnick for that reason only. 
Um, I agree with you on that as well, Kalnick. Absolutely. All right, next up, we've got a uh, little pitcher's duel here. We're talking about Taj Bradley coming in at 235, Reed Detmers at 238. It is important I preface this by saying Taj Bradley was scratched from his start with some pectoral issues, and, yep. and he had some some injury issues last year. He's got an um, MRI on that pec, too. So You know, and, and, and quite frankly, his ass gave up too damn much hard contact. He was bottom 5% in EV and hard hit percentage, but you love the strikeouts. Uh, just a hair over 11 strikeouts per nine, uh, 28% strikeout rate, which are both fantastic. You look at his line from last year, he was five and eight, an ERA of 559, a 138 whip, and 104 innings pitched, 142 total between the minors and the show. The ERA is high, but his expected ERA was a run lower, and his XFIP was at 383. So there was a, a bit of bad luck there, and and you know, but there's still some room for improvement. Gets excellent movement on his curveball and his four seamer. And, and quite frankly, I trust the Rays when it comes to pitcher development, but he's not going to be worth a whole hell of a lot unless he finds a way to limit the hard contact. He ever he gave up two home runs per nine innings, which is just unsustainable at any level of baseball, let alone the minor league or major leagues. Sorry. Um, <laughs> he's got two minor league options left. So, you know, this injury or potential injury aside. If we don't see improvement, there's some doubt as to if he'll be up for the full season. Um, walks weren't really the issue. His 8.5% rate was just a tenth above league average. Uh, but interestingly enough, he did walk twice as many batters on the road than he did at home in an equal number of innings. He walked 26 dudes on the road, just 13 at home. Look, the guy's just 23 years old, and, and he flashed last year. And that's really what you want to see out of these young guys is, is just just show me that you've got something in there, and he absolutely does, and he's got it in spades. I had him on my team last year in my home league, and I loved the strikeouts and absolutely despised the fact that he would throw three innings and, and strike out six dudes in that time and then come out from the fourth and just get touched up. So he's, he's got to work on that consistency, but his ass needs to get healthy first. He looked halfway decent so far this spring. Uh, Reed Detmers. Ugh, Jesus. Young guy, still 24. I think it could be a breakout season for him, but he struggles uh, with consistency. Um, his velocity kind of had me excited at the beginning of last year. He was 95, 96 miles per hour early in the year. And then as the season went on, uh, went on his slider command fell. His curve was inconsistent. Um, then in September, he, he tried something new and a changeup that actually worked. So four pitches, uh, if he has those four pitches and his velocity can climb back up to 95, 96 again, I like that. Um, he has continually posted better strikeout numbers. Uh, in 2021, he was at 18.8. Last year, he was at 26.1. Very good. Unfortunately, what really does him in sometimes is that walks 3.63 per nine. That's going to continue uh, to limit him if he falls in line with those numbers again. Um, shit. I think his <laughs> his profile features enough strikeout upside to, to make a difference for your team at this current ADP. I think there's stuff, uh, there's still reason to believe there could be more left for him to unlock. He's thrown a couple, started a couple games this, this spring already, um, but hasn't done well. Uh, he did have eight strikeouts and, and four innings pitched, but a lot of three earned runs, four walks. So he still hasn't figured that out. But again, he's tinkering. Um, somebody I'm high on this this late in, in the uh, in the draft. Taz Bradley was somebody I was high on, but right not right now. So imagine this, you go to the club and, and you look out on the dance floor and you, you see this nice round hind end and, and you see it, you know, a chick, she's stacked, you know, long hair in the back and just the way the hips are moving. It's amazing. And then she turns around and it's like, oh God, what the hell happened to your face? 
that's Reed Detmers. <laughs> Reed Detmers is the butterface of pitchers because he tantalizes you with, with all that he's been on. Everybody's always going to break out list for, it seems like the past five years. Yeah. And it just, you see again, it, it's the flashes and the flashes and the flashes, and he's yet to put it all together. And what happens is he ends up frustrating people. His ass gets dropped and then somebody else falls victim to, Hey, well, I saw her from behind and she looked great there. <sighs> Yeah. I, I don't know. Considering he's, you know, not hurt, I'll go with Detmers and, you know, we'll just keep the lights low. All right. Same. <laughs> All right. We got uh, a couple more dudes to, yeah, to get Let's through. Let's see. Andrew Abbott. Oh, you're first. My bad. Yeah. That's all right. You've been doing it all night. Yeah. Mm. All right. Andrew Abbott at 270. Emmett Sheehan at 271. Um, here's the thing. Andrew Abbott is a conundrum. Had a decent ERA last year, 387 ERA and a 420 FIP and, and uh, 109 and a third innings of work. <clears throat> Struck out 120 dudes, gave up 44 walks, 16 bombs. Here's the thing. He pitched significantly better at home in that ballpark, which is mind-blowing, right? Like, holy shit, how did that even happen? He had a 26.1% strikeout rate. Walks were high at 9.6%. Uh, hard hit in, in EV were, I mean, bearable, a little bit high. Here's the thing, though. Like, he gives up a lot of fly balls. His ground ball rate is 14% below league average. And if you look at him when he first come up, he had a 190 ERA through his first 10 starts, and then he gave up three or more earned runs in six of his last 11 starts. He only reached the seventh inning three times. He faded off big time in the second half. Could be fatigue, hitters adjusting, could be a whole hell of a lot of things. Quite frankly, we just don't know. The ballpark scares me. He's off to a bumpy start this spring. I'm I'm probably out on him even at this low cost. Uh, yeah, Emmett Sheehan, first year in the majors last year. Um, finished the season on a high note, mostly in relief. I kind of like him. Um he was able to whip up some sliders for whiffs in, in his last few starts uh, of the season, and he's got a legit changeup as well. Um, and I think that allows his his four seamers uh, to play better than usual. Does lack uh, control, even though he has pretty good strikeout potential. Uh, he was above average last year with twenty five point eight in the majors, but he was forty one percent in Double A and thirty seven percent in Triple A. It looks like he'll get a chance to to start. But he could also spend time in the pen this year, too. I know last month the Dodgers were talking about a six-man rotation, which I thought would easily uh, allow Sheehan to get in. But uh, it sounds like they've since changed their tune, and, and they're not going to do that. But, you know, who the hell knows? Um, I know they're real high on him because they called him a uh, up from double-A Tulsa last year. So uh, that tells you everything you need to know how high they view him. I don't think he's going to pitch very deep into games but i think he has the opportunity to rack up some wins uh thanks to the the fucking run support there um i'm excited about him this year yeah same i'll go with Sheehan over abbott nice all right next we got another tiger here reese olsen versus jose abreu the 24th round these dudes are essentially free um Last year, Reese, five and seven, started 18 games, appeared in 21, had a 399 ERA, a, a whip, which was very respectable at 1.11 and, and struck out 103 guys, 24.4% per, uh, strikeout rate, walk rate mm -hmm. below average at 7.8%. Hard contact was a little high at 42.6% with a 90.7 mile an hour exit velocity. Here's the thing with this dude. He has three secondary pitches with amazing movement. His slider clocks in at 2,989 RPMs, 600 RPMs more than average. That's a lot. It is. And we've not brought it up to this point. Matt, why in the hell does that matter? The more the ball or the faster the ball spins, the more movement you get. The more movement you get, the harder the pitch is to hit. He's got a nice 10 mile an hour delta between his slider and his four seamer. And, and even despite the higher ERA, he had an ERA plus a 111. He's somebody, I think he's a fantastic upside play. I think he's going to get more strikeouts this year. In his last uh, appearance here in the spring against Houston at their camp against their starters, one run on two hits and a walk, 
with three strikeouts across four innings through 40 of his 66 pitches for strikes. Put his ass on my team, and, and he can saddle up next to Scooble. Absolutely. Jose Abreu. Whew. God, this guy was good when he was younger. Um, had his first year there in Houston. Down year offensively. Uh, 680 OPS is just horrible. That was uh, a career low uh, by almost 120 points. Um, but still a run producer in the middle of a loaded lineup. And he also had uh, some of the worst batted ball luck of his career last year with a 271 bat pip. It was over 50 points below his career average. So hopefully that can get uh, in his favor this year because he was absolutely fucking horrible the first two months of the season. Like he was unfucking playable the first two months of the season. Uh, yes, but from was. June to the end of the year, 17 home runs and 64 RBIs would have put him on pace for a 34 128 year. His power days are, are, Likely they're 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 kind of past him, but um, I think he's in for a better year at the plate. He can be a great value this late in the drafts, playing for a, a, you know an Astros team, top five offense. Um, if he can even just hit two fifty, I think he's a threat to drive in a hundred runs. Sure, and, and I think with with this competition right here, it goes back to my earlier statement. Late in the draft, I'm looking for upside. Reese Olson gives you just that. It does. All right, our last matchup. Lance Lynn, an ADP of $8 million against D.L. Hall with an ADP of $8 million and one. <laughs> D.L. Hall come over to the Brewers, you know, in, in the Corbin Burns trade. We all know who Lance Lynn is at this point. He's gone over 180 innings three times since 2017. I think he's a good bet for 150. He's going to strike out a, a little bit better than a batter per inning. He's going to walk around the league average. One thing he's always excelled at is limiting hard contact. Average exit velocity and hard hit rate are well below league average. But really for him, home runs have become the issue over the last four years. Somehow this dude threw seven different pitches last season. He added a sweeper when he went to the Dodgers. He actually had a career high 28.7% whiff rate last season. Um, he's got the reputation as an innings eater, despite the fact that, again, he's only gone over 183 times in the, in the last six years. In his only spring start this year, he got tossed by the best umpire in Major League Baseball, Angel Hernandez. Oh, yeah, the best. Uh, <laughs> after allowing four earned runs on three hits and three walks while fanning two and in two innings. Oh, D.L. Hall. Ooh, lefty. Uh, like you mentioned before, he was uh, part of that return in the Corbin Burns trade with Baltimore. Um, he had 18 appearances all in relief last season. He's so-so. I think his stuff is is good enough to draft as a flyer. Um, I mean, I don't think they just traded for him just to make him their random seventh inning fucking guy. So I think he competes for a rotation spot uh, in 2024. He's got that prospect pedigree. He was around one pick in, in 2017. Um, pretty elite in the strikeout round there. 29% for his pro career so far. Some control issues. I would also assume some... some um, Innings pitched uh, limits this year as well, but I'm intrigued by him. Yeah, he, he's an intriguing pick. Flip a coin for me, honestly, yeah. with these two. I, I do like the way that Milwaukee develops their pitchers. They do a hell of a job there, so maybe that gives D.L. Hall the edge over Lance Lynn. Right. But it's... Or, or if you're Lance Lynn, flip a cheeseburger because that guy needs to <laughs> maybe lay off the burgers. <laughs> Modern day David Wells. <laughs> he's a big boy. <laughs> All right. That is going to wrap up today's episode. This has been a fun little exercise, yeah, you know, like a, a little would you rather either or whatever it may be. For those of you that stuck around with us, we certainly appreciate it. We did run a little long today by by just a few minutes. Again, if you haven't already, we'd really appreciate it if you could find a way to like and subscribe and come on back and hang out with us Thursday night. We're going to be here at seven o'clock talking about our top 150 players for the upcoming fantasy season. We're going to talk about some dudes that we haven't got around to yet. So it's going to be a nice, fun conversation. Oh, let's hold on. Anthony, like a pin on a fantasy topic. Do you have a second? Absolutely, dude. Of course. Absolutely. Shoot. Let us know what you're thinking. Do you got any questions? And like, uh, and you can always, Anthony, reach out to us uh, to the email, any of the um, socials, the socials as well. I had a graphic as well. We're on it all. Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok, 
X or Twitter or whatever you're all calling it this days, but uh, we're always monitoring that stuff. So feel yeah, free. Absolutely. Fire away. Kyle will entertain us in the meantime. Yes. Um, I thought I had a joke lined up, but I can only remember half of it, so I'm not going to fuck it up. So I'm not going to say it. All right. So it looks like they have added batter strikeouts as a category. What do you think of that? Hmm. I would not be a fan. That, def that definitely changes your strategy a bit. It, it really does. Um, I, I honestly would, would not want to play in a league that added batter strikeouts. I can understand the logic behind it. Yeah. Now it, it would have been a lot worse a, a couple of years ago when the game was more of a, a three true outcomes game. <sighs> Damn, that's that's rough, brother. I mean, even in points leagues, you, you get negative points for striking out, but as a batter, but as a category, ugh, I agree. I don't really like it. I'm curious how it turns out, but yeah, you would definitely. Man, sure. you would definitely some of the guys that you might target, you could probably think of one off the top of your head. You might not want, or you might want a lot later. Sure. Uh, so we got Anthony saying big time, but it seems like it takes more work and the better teams do well. Um, you are absolutely right. And, and one of the, the rules of fantasy, the bigger your team size, so meaning more bench spots or whatever it is, or the more categories you have, that helps eliminate variance and luck. Sure. And, and makes it more of a skill-based game. So in theory, your better players, meaning fantasy players, not, not baseball players, are going to do better, all things being equal in leagues like that. And, and, you know, I mean, sure, could it be an interesting experiment? But if I was looking to jump into a league and I saw that as a category, I would probably continue on my search. Yep. So that's a great awesome. question, though. That's Absolutely. the first time I've heard of that. Yep. No kidding. All right. We'll see you guys Thursday night, seven o'clock Eastern. Have a good night, folks. See you.